Hi, my name is Anna Ratzliff and I'm excited to be here presenting with Ginger Jones on integrating mental health into primary care research and reality. Uh, we will work together to talk about these learning objectives. First, we'll discuss the challenges in mental health access, including disparity populations that are addressed by an integrated approach. We'll list the core principles of evidence-based integrated care, specifically the collaborative care model, and we'll name the core integrated care team member roles and responsibilities, um, and talk a bit about how that team works together to deliver better whole person care. So I work at the University of Washington and I co-direct the AIM Center and I'm really excited to share some of the learning that I've had over my last 10 years trying to both deliver care and support practices in implementing uh, evidence-based integrated mental health. I have a few disclosures here. Uh, I really like to start at the beginning, uh, which is how do we define health and the fact that the World Health Organization for many years has really defined health as the state of complete physical, mental and social well being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity infirmity. And I think it's really important um, to understand that uh, for many years, I think our systems, because of many reasons, including financing and policy, have often tried to separate physical and mental health. Uh, and the efforts in integrated care are really trying to bring those back together. You know, we have one person that has all of those components, and we really need to be able to deliver care to them um, as one whole person. And there's a lot of reasons why that's important. So I'll share a few of those on this slide. Uh, first and foremost, really, that psychiatric disorders cause significant disability and mortality. Uh, so if you think about this, something like 25% of all disability worldwide can be attributed to mental health disorders. Um, and that, you know, many people um, have, uh, disability related to depression, anxiety, and other common mental health disorders. And that the, these, this burden is three times as much as diabetes, 10 times as much as heart disease, and as much as 40 times as much as cancer. Um, so this is a real challenge uh, for us as a society to take on. And most importantly, we know that there are very serious consequences of not being able to adequately address behavioral health needs, uh, including, you know, at the at the time that these data were um, taken, a, a suicide about every 14 minutes. Um, and in Washington state, that means two to three suicides a day. Um, so untreated behavioral health needs are very, very serious. And really that none of us goes untouched, no family goes untouched from uh, these behavioral health needs. The other thing that's really important to understand is that when we don't adequately address behavioral health needs, it's really hard to have overall health. And that's because behavioral health determines about 50% of all mortality and morbidity. If you think about it, um, in order to take care of yourself, that requires you to engage in a lot of active processes, going to your providers, um, doing the kind in acting on the recommendations of your providers, even taking a medication every day. These are all behaviors. And and when people are struggling in the behavioral health domain, uh, they also really struggle to overall uh, take care of their physical health needs. Uh, so because of all these reasons, there's really a lot of motivation for us to think about better strategies to integrate physical and behavioral health. So I like to start by, by sort of understanding what, what currently happens in terms of access to care for behavioral health needs. Uh, so this slide represents uh, the population of people, and this is from a work that was done in 2005, and they took a national sample of people in the community, and they called them up on the telephone and they asked them, have you been seen for behavioral health, you have a behavioral health need, and have you been seen for that behavioral health need, and they defined being seen as a single visit um, in the last year. And what they found is that 60% of people who had a behavioral health need were not seen at all, not one single visit. Of the 40% that were seen, about half of those were seen in primary care and the other um, half were seen by a specialty behavioral health provider. And I think what I see when I look at these data are that we have a lot of opportunity to improve access to um, our populations around increasing how they access behavioral health care. 
And then if you look at this, a lot of that opportunity may rest in primary care or where they're getting their physical health needs met, because that's often the first place that someone's going to come into the system. Uh, so it's really important as, as we go through the rest of this presentation to be thinking about what those opportunities are um, for us to improve access to care. Uh, so a lot of times when I first present those data, people say, well, why don't we just do a better job referring people to specialty um, behavioral health or to behavioral health um, providers? And so I want to start with some of the patient factors that I think get in the way. Um, about half of those patients that are referred for uh, specialty behavioral health care don't follow through. Uh, and I think this is for a variety of reasons. You know, there are practical barriers like um, not having somewhere to go, not having transportation to go. There are also policy barriers, not having financing, um, or just getting lost in the system or even sometimes the symptom burden that they may have from their behavioral health needs. So if you're depressed, it's harder to get activated and follow through on a recommendation. Uh, the other thing that we see is often even if somebody does make it through all those hurdles, they may not stick very long in specialty behavioral health. And so, um, you know, as few as an average of two visits. And uh, I think all of you can imagine here that if you have a serious mental health disorder like depression or anxiety, it's going to take more than two visits to actually get better. Um, there are also provider factors why a referral system alone is probably not enough. Uh, this map represents the United States um, and really county level um, looking at behavioral health provider access. Uh, and what this study found is that 96% of the counties in the United States have an unmet need for prescribers. That means in most states and in most counties within those states across the United States, there is not adequate access to um, a prescriber. And that really has to do with the fact that we just don't have a big enough workforce of behavioral health providers. Um, there's, it's also true that there's a one in five um, unmet need for non-prescribers, so for therapists, counselors, those other kinds of behavior behavioral health provider. Um, what this means is that uh, referrals alone are never going to be enough because there's just not enough people to see all the people in need. So we really need to be thinking about new systems of care and how do we take that pool of workforce, that pool of providers we have, and really work in a new way um, to increase access for all those patients in need. Um, and I added this new slide, which is sort of why now or is it especially important that we talk about this? And I think with all of us um, really daily facing the impact of a pandemic, um, we can appreciate some of the challenges in the behavioral health rate, you know, area that, that might be coming up for patients. Uh, these are data from the CDC. It was a study done in June, and they basically did a very similar thing to what I described earlier. They took a national sample and, and called people and really asked them, you know, are you experiencing symptoms related to these common mental health disorders? And I think it's really important to note that there's three times as many people reporting significant anxiety symptoms, four times as many people reporting um, the presence of depressive symptoms, um, about 25% um, reporting some kind of trauma um, stress, uh, about 10% that have started or increased their use of substances, um, and then, you know, especially concerning twice as many people reporting serious consideration of suicide. So this means that we really have to act now to improve access to effective behavioral health care. And so I'm hoping that today I can share with you a few of the principles that I think um, really need to be in place to have an evidence-based model of integrated care available. Um, and I start with this diagram because what I want to share with you today is not that this replaces all of specialty mental health care. In fact, what I want to talk to you about is how do we increase that whole spectrum of services that are available for patients. So if you think about this pyramid um, and based on those data that I've already shared with you, most patients actually receive their care in primary care or they might even do that through self-management, through the use of apps, through the use of friends and family, through reading books. Um, that's where the majority of mental health care, especially for common mental health disorders, occurs. 
Um, what we'll be talking out about today is how would you build out a next layer up from that? Um, really expand what you can do in primary care, that place that patients are already coming, uh, and really make sure that patients can have access to effective treatment. Um, my hope is that by doing that, you actually are um, having a lot of patients whose needs are adequately addressed in primary care, and that allows for a bit more capacity in those specialty behavioral health settings for those patients who need those more intensive services like outpatient care, community mental health care, or even hospitalization. Um, so when, you, when we talk about um, adding collaborative care to our system of behavioral health, we're really talking about adding capacity, um, adding a new layer of care into that whole spectrum of behavioral health. So I'm going to talk about what the collaborative care model is briefly, and then I'm really going to spend time talking about the principles of what makes high quality effective integrated care um, in the next few slides. And the reason I want to do that is I want everyone kind of thinking about what are the opportunities for you to advocate for these kind of care or to even for yourself or for those that you're advocating for. Um, if you're a provider in the audience, I want you to be thinking about how could you bring some of these principles into your practice. Um, so this is um, a study that summarizes an important study that was completed in, in the early 2000s called the IMPACT study. And this work was done by Dr. Jurgen Unit. Um, this study um, looked at um, primary care and they took patients and they randomized them to one of two conditions. So they said, every patient that has depression here, we're either going to give you your usual care where your primary care provider can do everything they normally would do. They can refer out, they can refer down the hall, they can prescribe a medication, whatever you'd normally do or we're going to give them collaborative care. And in collaborative care, what they said is we're going to have a team that's going to wrap around um, that PCP and that patient, and we're going to help them be able to do um, proactive um, measurement-based treatment to target for depression. Um, so they started with a practice team. So that was the um, medical provider, that primary care provider working closely with that patient, patient-centered model. Um, they added in a behavioral health care manager. This was often a master's level social worker or some other behavioral health provider that was often on site in primary care. And then they added in expertise from a psychiatric consultant who might be available um, by telephone or by televideo, possibly on site, but a lot of different strategies for how that psychiatric consultation could come in. Um, and the main way that the psychiatric consultant contributed to that team was to actually provide um, a caseload review weekly with that care manager, and they would provide recommendations on treatment, on assessment and diagnosis, um, that that care manager would then communicate to the patient and the primary care provider, and together they would de deliver treatment. Um, there were several practice supports that were used. They used routine measurement-based treatment to target. So that means regularly they're actually assessing, is the depression getting better with whatever treatment we were doing? They use a population registry. Again, that's a list of patients, um, and that made sure that every patient that was identified was proactively given outreach until they um, came in enough to get better or, or in some cases were referred on to specialty behavioral health. Um, a registry is really important because it helps us switch from taking care of those patients to showing up that, to the patients that actually might need a little help to get engaged in care. And we'll talk a lot about that because I think that's a real opportunity for advocacy. Um, and then um, that makes sure no one falls through the cracks, right? So we don't have patients who need help who are not getting the treatment that they need. Um, and then treatment protocols. So these are really being able to make sure patients have access to the full range of treatments, medications, and evidence-based psychotherapies. And again, that there was that access of that psychiatric consultant. Um, and when they did this and they compared, you know, usual care to this wraparound care by, provided by a team, what they saw is in every single site um, that having that wraparound team doubled the chances that that patient got better from depression. So in every single site, um, twice as many people improved. Um, and that's a really big deal because if you think that, you know, you're one of those patients that has depression, if you're twice as likely to get better, that's a pretty big impact. So um, we think that this is a really important strategy when we think about how do we deliver high quality integrated behavioral health. 
Um, in addition to improved depression outcomes, there was better physical functioning, less pain, higher quality of life. Um, both patients and providers were satisfied with this care, um, and there was an overall reduced health care cost. So for um, every dollar spent, um, when they looked sort of over the next four years, there was um, a savings of about six dollars um, of health care spending, and most of that came from savings in physical health care. So when you treat people's depression, their overall physical health care got better, and they were less, they needed to spend less um, on, on health care over the next four years. Um, I, you know, this model went on to be tested by many other people. There's now actually almost over 100 randomized controlled trials. This is um, a summary of that that looked at the first 80. Um, they've also started to look at other conditions like anxiety, um, uh, substance use, um, depression, chronic pain, and shown this to be a good model. Um, I also wanted to quickly touch on um, healthcare disparities for racial and ethnic populations, because I think that's another important question is, okay, this works in some populations, but what about in diverse populations? And that's a really important question that I think we're all being challenged to ask more systematically. Um, and that's because we know um, that if you're in a disparity population, that your access to mental health care is, is not equal, and that many people are less likely to access mental health services um, and more likely to use um, inpatient um, hospitalization and emergency rooms as the first access to care. So we really want to look for models that will also be help helpful for these disparity populations. And um, there now are some systematic reviews of collaborative care for racial and ethnic populations. Um, there were 19 studies included in this recent review. Um, and what they saw is that in general, the, when collaborative care was delivered to um, racial and ethnic disparity populations, there were no major um, culturally sensitive adaptations to that model. Um, and, and essentially what they found is that they still got really effective outcomes. So what this means is that that um, collaborative care may be a very important strategy, especially if you're trying to think about access to care for uh, disparity populations. Um, and these are just the data from that original impact trial that I already discussed with you. Um, they actually did have enough patients in both the Black and Latinx populations to actually show they got equivalent or better outcomes um, uh, when comparing them to the white population that was served in that trial. So I think those are really important data for us to take forward as we think about access to care. So what I'm going to do now in the last part of what I'm going to present today is just kind of run through the big principles that we take away from all of this research evidence, right? So I've covered with you so far, I think we have a really good strategy of how we might provide um, effective evidence-based integrated care for patients. And I've talked a little bit about um, those outcomes. Uh, what I want to talk about is out of those 80 trials, what was common? What was the secret sauce that really helped you get that better um, behavioral health care? So I'm going to talk through five core principles. And I really want you to be thinking about as I present to these, how might I as an advocate actually work to um, advocate for these principles or help support um, a patient or family member in engaging in care um, related to these principles? Because um, I think that's our, our real opportunity uh, out of our conversation today. So the first thing is really patient-centered team care. So this is that concept that you're going to really need good coordination amongst the team members that are responsible for the different aspects of integrating behavioral health. So if this is in a primary care setting, how do you facilitate conversation among the people that are in primary care? If somebody is out in a referral in a community setting or seeing multiple pro providers, what are the opportunities to really coordinate that care, um, make sure there's good communication. So I think that's really one of the core principles of collaborative care. Uh, the second one is that concept of population-based treatment, that idea that there's a registry and that we're going to switch from um, just reacting when somebody is in trouble to really proactively saying, gosh, we've recognized that this is a person that needs help and we need to proactively go out and try to engage them in care, support them in getting access to care um, until they're better. Um, and so this is really the idea that, you know, once you have a list of patients, for example, that need care, we're going to really work hard to 
to make sure they get connected to the care that they need. Um, and from a collaborative care perspective, that means we're going to be calling them, engaging them, trying to engage them when they come in for other care, um, all of those kinds of strategies. So this is really the idea that um, once you're in that population that needs help, you're going to be really persistent and not give up too easily um, when maybe patients aren't first engaged. The third principle we call measurement-based treatment to target, and it, that's a lot of words, um, that what they really say is we're going to keep measuring whether or not the treatments that we're giving you are working until you actually have met your goals. So um, there's two important components to this. One is really understanding what those goals are and then having a good measure of those. Um, if your goal is to treat depression to remission, the PHQ-9 is a really good measure because um, it helps a primary care team quickly understand what are the symptoms that you're still struggling with um, and, and be able to answer the question, did the first thing we offer you actually get the job done or do we need to actually try a few other things? Um, this is an example of a patient and I'll just tell the story really briefly. Um, this is a patient that came in to actually a community health center. It was a young college age student. She was actually one of my patients. Um, and when she first came in, she was really struggling with depression. Her team was able to assess and it really was depression. She didn't have substance use or anxiety or something else major going on. Um, and we were able to pretty quickly get her connected to um, behavioral intervention. She wanted to start with therapy and she did that with her care manager. Um, but what you can see in the, the middle column there that says PHQ-9 um, is that initially she started to get a little better, but when we measured again, she actually wasn't all the way better. You can see that score went from a 15 down to a 12, back up to a 17. Um, and that was a really pivotal point in her treatment because her care manager actually had been proactively reaching out to her. You can see she'd been actually calling her on the phone to make sure she came back into treatment. And the patient said she actually wasn't doing better and um, she actually needed a change in her treatment. She needed an increase in her medication dosage and she needed more help actually connecting into care. Um, and because we were able to do that and had that measure to tell us, gosh, this is a patient that needs more attention, um, she was able to get that change in treatment and you can see she had a really nice treatment response. Within the next six weeks, she actually had a complete remission of her depression symptoms. I think she's a really good example of how if we weren't measuring and doing that proactive outreach, she might have stayed stuck at that high level of depression for a lot longer. Uh, and for this particular patient, she was actually a college student. Um, if she'd stayed depressed, she might have dropped out of school. And I, I think, you know, we think about uh, sort of the societal cost of untreated depression or not being able to do that quickly. This is a good example of what, if you have that proactive team working closely, you can actually make sure patients keep getting their treatments changed until they get on the right one. Uh, and this is really important. Um, we've seen, this is a big trial that was done out of the Mayo Clinic, and what they basically saw is when you do that proactive measurement-based treatment to target, you drop the amount of time it takes for a patient to get better from about 90 days, um, you know, down to about 90 days from about three, um, about two years, 600 days. So um, essentially when you're regularly measuring and making proactive changes in treatment, um, you can knock 18 months off of somebody's treatment trajectory. That's a big deal for a, for a patient if you think about an extra, you know, 18 months of your life with, without depression. So um, it's a really important thing to think about how um, and be asking about how is this happening in your own care or those cares, um, the care that, of those that you're advocating for. Um, the fourth principle is really evidence-based treatment. This is really the idea that in good behavioral health treatment, you're offered a full range of treatments that you engage in shared decision-making with your providers around what treatment um, is the right one for you and that you keep making those adjustments um, and do have a range of options if that first treatment doesn't um, work. So this is just, that was one of the big things that we, we saw as being an important part of the secret sauce for patients. And last principle, um, I call accountable care and I put a compass here um, because this is really, if you're doing something a little different, if you're putting together a different team or you're working in primary care instead of in specialty behavioral health, you need to know what are your, your sort of benchmarks, what are your markers of success and make sure you keep asking, is, is this care actually getting enough people better? 
And I'll use one example. This is actually from the Mental Health Integration Program, which was in Washington State. Um, this was a statewide program for basically a Medicaid population. Um, and it was implemented by giving many clinics a care manager, a registry, and a psychiatric consultant. And they said, make amazing collaborative care happen. And what happened over the first year um, is that we saw patients did get better, but it was taking them about a year. So if you look at that blue line and kind of go down at 50%, it was taking about a year for half of the patients to get better. Um, what we did in that program, though, is say that wasn't good enough. That's better than the two years that we saw when there's, when there's nothing else going on, um, but not quite good enough. Um, and we actually said to the clinics, gosh, you have some quality measures that we're going to ask you to um, meet. They were all process measures. They were things like make sure you engage enough patients, make sure that you're actually seeing them regularly, you do that proactive outreach, make sure you're regularly having that psychiatric consultation ha um, happen to help um, improve the, the treatments that you're offering patients. And when we asked teams to meet certain quality metrics, what we saw is that over the next year, they were able to get most of their patients better in about half the time. So that time it needed, the time it needed um, for you to actually see that improvement um, dropped down to about 24 weeks. So that's a, a pretty big deal if you think about it. So um, one of the important principles is to think about if you're implementing this or any model, how are you gonna measure your success and, and make sure you keep um, checking up on yourself and make sure that you're actually delivering the quality of care um, that you aspire to. So um, in the last couple minutes, um, I have now, um, I, I'll kind of think about how do we take all this information that I've shared with you and actually put it in action. Um, and what I put together is a slide which is sort of advocacy opportunities, right? So I walked you through the evidence base um, for integrated care and really shared with you that we, we feel and we know from over 100 trials that we have a good model um, and we have a sense of that there's probably about five pieces of secret sauce that are really important or five principles that we should be working on. Um, and those are listed here. And I was trying to think about what are some ways that you and your role as an, a patient or an advocate or a provider might think about taking these and putting them into practice in your own um, world. So, you know, if you think about patient-centered team care, how do you facilitate the communication amongst the team of people um, that, that might be involved in a patient's care? Can you work on that really explicitly? Um, if you talk about measurement-based treatment to target, um, can you make sure that treatments, if treatments are working, um, you know, then great. If they're not, you know, can you advocate for change, right? Can you on your own kind of do measurement-based treatment to target from your own perspective? Um, can you support QI to monitor quality? I mean, as a patient or an advocate, you might be asking about how do they do that? Um, if you're a provider, you might be thinking about how can we deliver on that? Um, I would say, you know, broadly, I think almost all of us could advocate for implementation of more integrated care. I think you can see why I think that that's a powerful tool to increase access to care. Um, I think we can continue to think about how do we support um, systems that engage patients in care, make sure they don't fall through the cracks. Um, that's a really important and, and, um, target for advocacy. And then I do think, you know, the last one that I put on here is really advocating for the full range of treatment options from providers. You know, if that, you know, you were offered a medication and that isn't working, do you need a psychotherapy or vice versa or some combination? Um, so I think really these are a couple of ideas. I hoped to get your own ideas kind of um, growing and um, that you can leave uh, this conference today um, thinking a bit more about how you might advocate for increased um, access to effective integration care. And I'll go ahead and stop there. Um, I do direct the AIM Center. We have lots of free materials if any of this got you really excited, including a really nice patient story if you wanted to see what this type of care and action might be like from both a patient and their family's perspective. And I'll go ahead and stop there. Thank you very much. And now we'll hear from Ginger Jones, CEO of MyCare Alliance. Thank you. And I'm so happy to be with everybody virtually today. Dr. Radsliff did a great job of explaining whole person care and mental health treatment and why that is so important. My goal today is to provide you with some practical knowledge and tools that you can incorporate into your everyday practice. 
So as this conference is about whole person care, it seems only fitting that we recognize two of the thought leaders, and I dare say health advocates, um, that have influenced me Western medical practice. Florence Nightingale coined a saying, let each person tell the truth from his or home, her own experience. And Sir William Osler, he was one of the first four founding professors of John Hopkins University, said the good physician treats the disease, but the great physician treats the patient that has the disease. So while the influence of these thought leaders and the concept of whole person care really began to become ingrained in our Western medicine culture in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. It took a long time to get to the conversation we're having today. Unfortunately, over the last 150 years, the approach taken by the healthcare system recognizes the importance of whole person care, but something's been missing. Have you ever heard of or been exposed to a provider um, that approached whole person care or something like this? When I want your opinion, I'll let you know. I have. I, I have been around that approach quite a bit. <laughs> um, we understood, in theory, that we needed to consider the whole person, but we did not put the person with their cultural beliefs their personal preferences, their family situations, and their lifestyles in the center of that plan. In fact, there were many that thought empowering people to take charge of their own health rather than being passive recipients of services was simply madness. Just couldn't figure out why we would do that. Well, it's not madness. What it is is person-centered care. And in the past, people were expected to fit in with routines and practices that the health and social services felt were most appropriate for them. But we sat around and scratched our heads and couldn't figure out why they were not compliant. Well, I think we're beginning to see because we missed person-centered care. There's no one single definition of person-centered care, but there is a consensus and a large amount of research that supports the fact that empowering people to take charge of their own health care can improve overall health outcomes. While terrific programs like the collaborative care program Dr. Radsliff talked about at the beginning of her pre presentation are emerging and gaining popularity, the, re the reality is that often the healthcare system does not make this easy. And I really believe that reality is that healthcare advocates are needed. We know there's a need and we know it's important, right? But why are so many healthcare advocates reluctant to get involved in advocating for mental health issues? Before we talk about practical matters of how advocates can participate in creating pathways to healing their clients with mental health issues, it's really important to take a look at how you're currently approaching these types of situations in your own practice. If you can relate to this picture, believe me, I am not judging you. There are a lot of reasons that you may react this way. Mental health issues affect every area of a person's life and thus are very complicated and multifactorial. And if you've ever tried to advocate for somebody with complex mental health issues, and attempted to navigate this alone, you have probably come up against more than one obstacle. When, fa when we're faced with a situation where we know we're going to encounter obstacles, it's our instinct to want to stick our head in the sand and avoid that altogether. But today I wanna to challenge you to consider if those of us that are professional health advocates take this approach, how can we expect to see improvement or change on a large scale? We know it's right, so let's take the lead and advocate for our clients. To get started, first we're gonna get real about some of the obstacles we're going to face, and then we'll talk about and consider some techniques and tools that might be helpful to you. I wanna challenge you to think about how you practice advocacy. Undoubtedly, if you're working as a health advocate, it's probably because you possess a certain amount of expertise. And yes, 
there's a lot of validated evidence about what's best practice. But take a minute to consider what your approach is. Do you relate to picture A? <laughs> Are you trying to make your horse drink water from the trough because you believe they need to? Or are you ready to walk with your client like the man in picture B? In order to walk with your client, it's essential to the success that you gain an understanding of what your client actually needs, not what you think they need. So we're gonna start shifting our thought process here. It's also very important that you do a self-assessment of your own beliefs, perspectives, and expectations surrounding mental health and behavioral issues. The barriers that our minds create are the biggest obstacles that we face. There's a lot of truth to that in more than one way. When we're dealing with mental health issues, we not only face obstacles we've created in our own minds, but simultaneously we're trying to overcome obstacles in our clients' minds and their families' minds. We can't ignore that there are a multitude of obstacles outside of our own mindset but it's gonna be helpful to explore some ideas about how you're gonna deal with these when they come up in general and be prepared to set some boundaries for yourself because the nature of this uh, mental health issues um, can lead to a lot of negative energy and can be very draining. And so you need to know where your boundaries are. Some obstacles that you might encounter frequently with clients and their families might be that they've accepted that this is the way it is. It's not gonna get any better. They might be hopeless about the situation. Um, sometimes uh, family and caregivers can be very frustrated and just at the wits end with, they can't deal with it another day or they don't have any more energy left. Um, or the mental health issues may have caused your client to become alienated from their support systems their families and friends, so they may not even have a natural support system at this point. Now that we've taken an honest look at what some of the obstacles are, let's get down to some more practical matters. What does a business of empowering someone to take charge of their own health care even look like? Well, in order to understand that, we've got to look at some of the core principles of person-centered care. And that's that we need to respect people's values and put people at the center of care. You need to take into account that their, prefer their preferences and the needs that they express. Um, you need to work together with them to make sure that there's good communication. And sometimes that means that you have to provide them with information and education in a, in a format that they can understand. You need to make sure that they are safe and comfortable both physically and emotionally. Involving family and friends when support is needed is crucial. And making sure that there is continuity not only within services, but between services. And making sure people have access to appropriate care when they need it. These are all core elements of person-centered care. So you don't have to, there's no one formula, but if you can remember the elements, you can be successful. Think about gathering your team. We as healthcare advocates often complain how siloed our healthcare system is. So don't make the same mistake. Don't silo yourself in your practice. It will not benefit you and it will not benefit your client. Consider what strengths you bring to the table. Who else do you need to get involved? Do you need to collaborate with other advocates with a specific area of expertise? Do you don't feel threatened that by bringing someone else in because building a network of people with whom you routinely collaborate can be very, very helpful and ultimately usually results in more business for you, not less. So don't feel threatened. Now let's start looking at some methods. You may already use a process like this or one very similar, but for those of you that are feeling a little overwhelmed at the thought of working with these issues, we can take a look at an example 
of a methodology that might be helpful to you. This is the process for care management. It's validated, it's effective, and guess what? You don't even have to be a care manager to integrate this into your practice. The first step is screening. Screening tools are used for early identification of individuals at potentially high risk for a specific condition or disorder. They're gonna help you indicate a need for further evaluation or preliminary intervention. And they're, they're, remember, they're generally brief and narrow in scope. Here's another misconception. You do not need to be licensed to administer a screening. <laughs> there are a multitude of tools and trainings on how to use them. There are several included on the AIMS website that this Dr. Radscliffe referred to. Um, screening tools are also, remember, very useful in monitoring treatment progress and outcomes or a change in symptoms over time. The PHQ-9 is a very good example of this. And these are just examples of, of a couple. General, uh, the GAD-7, the post-traumatic stress, uh, MOCA is the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. We could go on and on, but there are tools. Okay, now let's talk about the assessment. To be the most effective, your assessment should be person-centered and focused on the whole person. As health advocates, we all tend to have our own way of doing things. Mine's different from yours, yours is different from mine. It doesn't mean mine's right, yours wrong. But it is important that you understand and you are able to support and validate why you do things the way you do them. So I encourage you to have a systematic approach for gathering and ordering, organizing your data, your assessment data, that's important. You gotta be thinking about who is going to receive the information, how do they wanna receive it, what key pieces will each team member be interested in. So if you can kind of think about some of this up front, it will help you to organize your assessment. Um, I'll give you an example of organizing an assessment. As a, as a nurse, I found that hundreds of times I would ask a patient if they had any health issues. Um, and it might be, you know, I might be working in the hospital. It didn't matter where I was, home health hospital. Do you have any health issues? No. Okay. But when I would get to the part of the assessment, when I would start collecting the information about their medications they were taking, I would see a medication for an antidepressant and a water pill and a blood pressure pill. Uh, and so then I would have to go back and say, okay, why are you taking this? So I started being more strategic about where in the assessment I gathered their list of medications so that I didn't waste time, <laughs> I mean, going re rehashing information. Another place that I found um, that historically people did not do a good job of communicating was when I asked them what kind of medical history they had. And that's pretty typical, even on like every physician form you go fill out in a new provider office, what's your medical history? Da, 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 da. People often don't know. They don't know the, either the terminology, um, the communicator, or they just don't think about it. Um, so what I went to was tell me what symptoms you've been dealing with. And that was more effective than the medical history, um, but it was still kind of broad and people seemed to have trouble with it. So then I moved on to a systematic review. And so I would talk about, you know, the nervous system. And it, are you having any headaches, dizziness, seizures? Are you having any symptoms here? Pain, physical, musculoskeletal symptoms. Are we having any of these? So it helped me um, to elicit uh, the, the appropriate information about what issues they were having and then the medical diagnosis and that stuff follows. Um, but if you think about it, you know, if I, I'm, I could have call a physician, I'm not gonna say they have congestive heart failure. That doesn't really tell him what problems they're having. I need to communicate their symptoms. So that's just a, a little example of how structuring your assessment can be helpful. Let's quickly touch on what we need to gather in a whole person assessment and why it might be pertinent. Okay, now 
you'll see two pictures up here. One is of an electronic health record. Um, there's tools you can use that are already developed like electronic health records and they can't really see it very well on the slide, but um, a lot of these aspects that are in the what to gather are already built into the assessment. So you don't have to recreate the wheel if you don't have one. There's paper assessments that do the same thing. But, and these are not in a particular order, okay? But the important things to gather, you're gonna gather their medical history, their symptom history, their background. Well, what's that mean? Well, what language do they speak? What's the primary language spoken in their household? Do they work? Did they work? What was their profession? What's their education level? All these things will help you develop an appropriate plan for them. Benefits kind of goes without saying, but also you don't only want to ask them what benefits they have. You're gathering information in the assessment to help you identify if there's other benefits they might be eligible for. Treatment profiles, that kind of goes along with medication profiles, but are they receiving any treatments? Are they going for mental health? Are they going now or have they in the past gone to counseling? Have they tried different techniques? Are, do they have a wound? Are they visiting the wound care center? Um, it's real important to get an understanding of their pain, if they are having pain and where that source of pain is. Sleep patterns, pain and sleep patterns heavily affect mental health. So um, I have like certain questions that I ask about both of these measures and it allows me not only to gather the information, but when I go back, it allows me to measure it because they are told me exactly kind of what issues they were having. Um, health habits, are they a smoker? Do they have substance abuse issues? Uh, are they overweight? Um, relationship map, this one can be very important. Um, and there's some really cool little tools to help you do this. But basically, you need to not only ask who their emergency contacts are, it's very helpful to establish how they're related to them. So most people have like a core and inner circle of people that help, that really support them in every aspect. It might be like a daughter, a husband, a wife. They're in that inner circle. Then there's another ring, if you can visualize this circle with several rings. And in the second ring, it may be a church family, um, a support group. And then the outer ring might be their physician, their provider, their hospital. But if you can kind of map that out in your mind when you're going through the plan, and you'll see um, later on that when we make the plan, we gotta identify who's gonna do what. So this will help you out a lot in knowing, understanding who is available to do what, <laughs> um, and communicating that to others. Um, living arrangements, you, know, you would think this could go without saying, but, this actually, it's not just where do you live, um, who do you live with? Um, what is the type of domicile? And are you able to physically function fully effectively in this, in this living arrangement? Are you able to afford your rent or house payment? Um, caregivers, if they have caregivers, who are they? <laughs> what do they do? Are they paid caregivers? Are they not? Um, you need to understand if they, especially with mental health issues, if they currently have a power of attorney or a guardianship in place. Um, because, well, if they currently have it, you're probably gonna have to get that person involved. If not, depending on the problem, you may end up having to help them get one established. So um, that's really important. In emergency contacts, of course, functional ability is really big. Um, you know, you can't just, it's looking at that whole person. If somebody cannot um, dress themselves or feed themselves or shop for themselves or talk on the phone by themselves or drive themselves, um, this is going to greatly affect your plan. So you really want to get a good idea of where they are at functionally. And um, another example that I'll tell you about is um, I'm gonna make sure that I'm not going over time. Okay, okay. <laughs> Another example that I'll tell you about is um, functional ability plays plays more than more of a role than you may think. Um, and I, I'm gonna tell you, I just lost that thought process. <laughs> 
so we're going to move on. <laughs> we'll go back to script. <laughs> it may pop back up in a minute. <laughs> okay, so we have completed the screening and our assessment, and now it's time to analyze the data and stratify the risk. So it's a real important to remember that you cannot save the world in a day. And there may be many issues, but you're going to have to start somewhere. So first, consider what immediate safety risks might be at hand. If they're suicidal, if they have um, an environmental threat that poses a risk to their safety, those things need to be acted on immediately. Now, if you can eliminate any immediate safety risk, you can move on to the next phase. And that's starting to consider what are primary problems, okay? And then you can think about the secondary problems. An example of a primary problem would be something that's causing other problems. So let's say the client has a herniated disc that causes them chronic pain. And because of this chronic pain, they don't sleep, they're depressed, and they're socially withdrawn. If we address the primary problem and eliminate, we fix the disc or go through surgery or eliminate this pain issue, the secondary problem is going to start to resolve itself. But if we start focusing on the secondary problem, we're probably not gonna get very far. So it's real important that you get an understanding of what the primary problems are. And the conclusions that you draw from this analysis are going to, um, prompt conversation between you and your client. And at that point, you're gonna share concerns that you have and um, they're gonna help and help understand how they can prioritize their concerns. So, you, so you, can, you can begin to formalize a plan of care. So before you formalize the plan, um, I'm gonna go back. No, I, I, never mind. Um, before you formalize the plan, you have to educate the client about what options are available and get an understanding of what's important to them. So you have to kind of, that's where that conversation comes in. I'm concerned about this. What are you concerned about? It goes back to the leading the horse to water but not being able to make him drink. You may have identified things and stratified them as a fairly high risk for the client, but they're not motivated to act on it it's not, and you put that in the plan as the first thing to do, it's not going to do you or them any good because you, they're not ready to act. I found this a repeated challenge for my nurses when we were working with clients. They would go through these first three steps in the process and they would appropriately identify and stratify the risk. But then the client wouldn't want to act on the measures to reduce the risk. So maybe the heart of the matter would have been something as simple as the living environment they were in or a relationship um, that they were exposed to. Um, and the simple solution might have been, let's just remove them from the situation. But the client didn't want to go. Well, if we continually keep prodding them and to do what we know is best for them, are we gonna develop a sense of trust and respect? No, and we're not gonna be able to achieve our goals to the, to the highest level. Who really gets to decide what's important? In person-centered care, it's your client. But it is your duty to educate them about the risk. So one of the things that we came up with in our practice to help facilitate this with our nurses was a concerns form. And we utilize this form. So we, at the beginning of a new intake, we gave one to our client, we gave one to the caregivers. And then after the assessment, the nurse filled one out. And we did it by systems. And these are things I'm concerned about. And so after that, we would look and say, okay, you reported to me that you're concerned because you can no longer drive. Your caregiver reported to me that this is their concern. And here's the concern I see. Are you ready to do something about this? Should we put this in the plan? Where do you prioritize this? And if they say, eh, I'm not real worried about it. Okay, make note of it, keep it on your list. But 
prioritize the plan so that you get what's important to them on there first. Also, it's real important to make sure that your plan is smart. It needs to be specific, measurable, achievable, relative, and time-based. You have to have a, a way to see, are you being successful with this plan? And remember, you say explore, prioritize, make, say, say who will do what and when. That's where that relationship map comes back in. And then share the plan. So I think it's very, very helpful to formalize the plan and write it down. The next step is going to be implementation. And um, this requires that you're gonna organize and communicate the data that you've gathered during your assessment and the screening. So you need to think about which team member you're communicating to. And this will help you be able to organize the information to best meet their communication needs. If you're communicating with a client or family member, you may have to do some education. Um, primary care physicians uh, in nursing school, we learned to use the SOAP method. So when you called the physician, you gave them the subjective information, the objective information, the assessment, and the plan. If you just called them with rambling on about a bunch of subjective information, they were gonna get very aggravated with you. So, um, have a method of communicating. When I looked on the AIMS website, there are two really nice tools which are actually put in a hyperlink here um, and we'll get you those resources. One was uh, tips for reviewing a case with your physician, uh, a provider, primary care provider, and one was uh, tips to consider when reviewing with psychiatric consultants. So I highly recommend you look at those. Kind of go through these next a couple, a little quicker because we're running close on time. Um, but other team members, such as caregivers, um, you may use a different type of communication tool. And these are a couple examples of some that might be beneficial. Um, a tool that says, talks about behaviors. When I stand up abruptly and move away from my work, if I'm not able to communicate effectively what my needs are, a behavioral tool might be very helpful for those caring for me. So when I do this, it means this. And here's how you can help me when you see me exhibiting this behavior. Um, and I'm happy to get you some more information on those and share resources for some of those tools. Um, another one, another kind of format to do this in are, um, I've seen it with a client photo in the center and this is kind of just like a face sheet. Um, what are some great things about me so that the caregivers working with me can do a lot of positive interaction? What's important to me? and how to best support me. These are great tools for communicating to caregivers. Lastly, follow-up must be taken into account. Multiple things um, will come into play, and this should be a fluid and ongoing process. Um, this also may be a time where you revisit measurable objectives, um, re employing some of your screening tools to give you a baseline on, on what's working or not. Or you might not use your screening tools, you might use something more like this and, and just a, a piece of pepper and what's working, what's not. <laughs> and then you can adjust the plan and, and move forward. Um, and then lastly, for closing, I just want to um, say that you know a health advocate's role is to assist, educate, support, and represent patients and their families so they're able to make appropriate healthcare decisions for their specific situation. And all these techniques and methods are just gonna help you be positioned to do that a little bit better. And I hope that you'll think about what role you're gonna play. <laughs>